can you give us some idea of what criteria we should use to determine what constitutes a humanitarian crisis? Uh, what criteria we should use to constitute appropriate action and response to a humanitarian crisis? Mm. And what criteria we should use to determine who is the appropriate agency to respond to humanitarian mm. crisis? I understand. Well, uh, there are, uh, we really have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's really hard to find. I mean, you can make some general statements, but the trick is to apply them to particular cases. So let's look at, uh, at the particular humanitarian crises and see what we can do about it, okay? Uh, so take, say, uh, the 1990s. Uh, we can look, there were many humanitarian crises then. Uh, one of the worst of them was in Iraq. Uh, U.S. sanctions in Iraq uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, maybe up to a million people. Uh, they strengthened Saddam Hussein. They uh, under destroyed. They destroyed any possibility of any uprising against Saddam. They forced the population to rely on him for survival. They were so horrendous that the uh, the administrators of the so-called oil for food program. Uh, two distinguished international diplomats, Dennis Halliday, Hans von Sponek, uh, both of them uh, resigned in protest because they regarded the sanctions they were asked to administer as genocidal, okay? Actually, just yesterday, I got a letter from Hans von Sponek uh, thanking me for having brought this up in a discussion in Oslo a couple of days ago, which was about your question. Uh, so yes, uh, that uh, there would be an easy way to uh, uh, end that humanitarian crisis, namely, don't take part in it. Okay, okay that's easy, doesn't cost anything. And there are many like that. Uh, one that was going on at the same time actually was in Turkey, not in the Balkans, uh, inside NATO, not near NATO. Uh, Turkey at that time was carrying out uh, vicious atrocities, trying to suppress uh, Kurdish uh, protest movement in southeastern Turkey. Uh, Kurds were deprived of the most elementary rights. They, they couldn't speak Turkish legally, uh, couldn't have the Turkish color or anything. They had to pretend to be mountain Turks, as they were called. And there was an uprising, and uh, uh, Turkey launched a counterinsurgency campaign, killed tens of thousands of people, uh, destroyed about 3,500 towns and villages, drove roughly three million people, something like that, uh, out of the region. Uh, that was pretty awful. Uh, it, uh, it was an easy way to stop that, namely stop participating in it. The arms were coming almost entirely from the United States, uh, about 80%. Uh, as the atrocities increased, uh, U.S. arms increased. In the year 1997, which incidentally is the year when Clinton was praised for the noble phase of his foreign policy with a saintly glow in the New York Times. Uh, in that year, Clinton sent more arms to Turkey than in the entire Cold War period combined up until the onset of the insurgency. So yes, there's an easy way to stop that one, uh, stop providing the arms. And if you like, I can run through a lot of other cases. So many cases of major atrocities can very easily be stopped by stopping our participation in them. And it works. Uh, one case that illustrated that uh, is the Indonesian invasion of East Timor in 1975, uh, authorized by the United States, uh, supported US provided arms. Britain came in, provided, in fact, most of the arms. This one was about as close to genocidal as anything in the post-war period. It was aggression and invasion and occupation. It wiped out maybe a quarter of the population, a third of the population. That went on right through 1999, always with strong U.S. support. Uh, the atrocities there were worse in 1999 than anything reported in Kosovo. And in fact, of course, the background was incomparably worse than anything in the Balkans. Uh, finally, in September 1999, uh, under quite a lot of domestic and international pressure, uh, Clinton quietly informed the Indonesians that the game was over. He told them, you're gonna have to leave. They left, instantly. 
a day later. That could have been done for the preceding 25 years. Now, that's now called a humanitarian intervention in a, with a level of cynicism, I don't know how to describe. Uh, so yeah, you could stop that one too. And there are many other cases like that, but those are not the kind of cases that are ever discussed. The only cases that are discussed is what are the criteria when somebody else is carrying out a crime? Okay, that's harder. It's much harder to stop somebody else's crimes than to stop your own. And uh, what are the criteria? Well, you know, difficult criteria. You have to ask what are the purposes? What are the likely consequences? Uh, uh, what are the general effects? Uh, you know, a lot of particular considerations have to be looked at, which are complex. But I don't really, th it could be an interesting question. I don't think there's much point discussing it, frankly, because uh, the question almost never arises. In fact, I can't think of a case where it's arisen. As I said at the very beginning, it's hard to find a case in history of a genuine humanitarian intervention, one carried out for humanitarian goals uh, and with consideration of what the consequences would be. And since if the question doesn't arise, it's very hard to answer. Thank you.